Good afternoon and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Matias Valenzuela. I'm the director of the Office of Equity and Social Justice here at Dr. Martin Luther King County. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, and this is just a wonderful space. And, uh, you know, the question I was just asking myself about an hour ago was whether we were going to get enough bodies in here. And now we've actually had a UC upstairs and we have using some of the uh, capacity. So that's great. Um, we will be asking people to, to come during the conversation cafe part of the program if they can try to make their way down. And we'll also uh, send, try to send some uh, conversation hosts uh, upstairs too. So again, thank you for coming. Uh, it's a special year this year. We're not only marking Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday, but also uh, 50 years since his uh, assassination. It's a day to remember our county's namesake, but it's not just about reflection. We all know we can best honor his legacy by fighting for civil rights, equity, and social justice every day in our professional life and in our personal lives. I can say that I am very proud to work for Dr. Martin Luther King County that has made equity and social justice a top priority and central to what we do. During a time when we hear a lot of national divisions, othering, we have made an unequivocal commitment to being welcoming, accepting, and celebrating differences. And it just doesn't stop there. Since we are committed to the harder work of addressing the root causes of problems, that means issues around poverty, lack of opportunity, structural racism, and access to all of our determinants of equity. Whether you work in the courts or transportation or health and human services or any of the other areas of county government or whether you're a community partner that is here, we must be part of the solution because sadly, if you're not working to improve our inequities, and there are many of them across all areas, then you're actually contributing to the problem and the status quo is not going to cut it. Dr. Martin Luther King himself epitomizes the changes that we are now trying to do as King County government. It's both personal transformation and transformation of the conditions in our community. So with that, I want to acknowledge uh, the great representation we have from our elected officials today. Um, and if you could hold the applause till the very end. Uh, besides two of our speakers, uh, Executive Dow Constantine and Council Member Larry Gossett, we have Council Member Rod Dombowski, we have uh, Elections Director Julie Wise, we have our Assessor John Wilson, uh, we have our, our sheriff, Mitzi, uh, Joe Hank Nick. Uh, we have our uh, prosecuting attorney, Dan Satterberg. And we have a council member from uh, City of Burien, Austin Bell. So let's thank them for being here. <laughs> also, um, can I have the members of uh, our Conversation Cafe planning group and an advisory group, which is an employee-based group, and also the members of the MLK committee who supported the creation of the 2018 calendar, if you could please stand up and be acknowledged at this time. You'll be hearing more about this, but we're gonna be doing our first conversation cafes on race, and you'll be hearing a lot more about this during 2018, which is a partnership between the Office of Equity and Social and Alternative Dispute Resolutions, working with this employee-based group that I mentioned. I wanna also uh, call a special thank you to Tanisha Walker, who's been the project manager. So more to come on that. Next speaker is gonna be our uh, council member, uh, Larry Gossett. I wanna introduce him uh, uh, here. Um, Briefly, and it's very hard to keep this introduction brief, but besides being a longtime King County Council member and a champion for civil rights, uh, Larry Gossett earlier in his career was the longest serving uh, executive director of the Central Area Motivation Program, the oldest anti-poverty organization west of the Mississippi. Uh, Larry Gossett is also the sole surviving member of the Gang of Four. It's an unprecedented alliance uh, between black, native, uh, Latinx, and Asian Pacific Islander friends and partners working for social justice. And in talking with Council Member Gossett recently, this is just something new that I learned, uh, that he and Roberto uh, Maestas, we were two of the members of the Gang of Four along with Bernie Whitebear and Bob Santos, they are part of the University of Washington's Wondrous 100, 
So a group of the most influential UW, UW alumni. So go dogs and go um, Council Member Gossett. So with that, Council Member Larry Gossett. King County family. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, I get a lot of opportunities to speak on uh, Dr. King's legacy uh, throughout our community. And one thing that has struck me uh, as a very interesting phenomenon is that young people, college, high school, junior high, they say, Dr. King lived a long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> but guess what, y'all? On this coming Monday, May, uh, January 15th, 2018, he would only be 88 years old. My mother, who I go to uh, see at least once a week, was born five years before him. Dr. King was born in uh, uh, 1929. My mother was born in 1924. And we still have really nice uh, conversations. So he would not even be that old if he were amongst us today. But sadly, his life exactly uh, 50 years ago, this coming April 4th, uh, was snuffed out by an assassin's bullet. And even though all of us love him, particularly those of us who have the privilege and the pleasure of living in Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, County, uh, he has you know, superior support from all sectors of the population. But two months before he uh, was assassinated, there was a survey done by Harvard and Pew, and they found that uh, only about 46% of Americans thought that what he was doing was pop, uh, popular or positive uh, for our nation. So we still had a lot, of, a lot of controversy around people's misunderstanding or uh, insensitivity to the tremendous uh, legacy uh, that he had built up by 1968 and the very, very importance that he held uh, for our entire nation and that that had a lot to do with why he was brutally uh, murdered at a time that he was working to bring um, in Memphis, Tennessee, fair wages to mostly African American uh, workers who were uh, garbage men, they, I say men because most of them were men, uh, making 94 cents an hour. They wanted a dollar eight after he was killed and murdered a couple of weeks, into, a couple of months into that campaign. They offered the workers a uh, dollar and five. These are very important, the kind of issues that he dealt with were very important. But during the few minutes I have left, I would just like to take, and this is meant to be food that you all can mull over when we go into our uh, discussions, our courageous discussions, our sympathetic uh, discussions, our, our really willingness to open up our minds and spirits and hearts to what everybody around our table uh, is saying uh, about race relations uh, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy uh, today. And if we have meaningful conversations, I think that uh, the outcome will be very productive whenever we, wherever you go back to in terms of your workplaces uh, or your homes or your neighborhoods. 
Let me just give you a couple examples of uh, what I mean uh, by that. On Monday of this week at the King County Council a meeting, we had a discussion, and I don't know if Lisa Dugard is here. We had a discussion about whether or not uh, this county should pay or allow our public defenders to represent uh, families in inquest uh, when there's been a conflict and a citizen had, has been killed anywhere in Martin Luther King County, whether or not the county should pay uh, for their lawyer. And I'm really happy that um, County Executive Dow Constantine and County Prosecutor uh, Dan Satterberg and uh, many, many uh, police officers uh, from whom we met all supported that idea. And I think that our county is unique in that aspect because I don't think that would have been done any other. Matter of fact, most of, okay, let's get here. Most other states do not even uh, make inquest uh, uh, important component part of the system that they have for dealing with uh, killings by government officials. The other uh, example that I'd like to mention before I sit down and bring our esteemed county executive up has to do with Colin Kaepernick and the controversy that has arisen the last uh, couple of years around uh, him starting a movement where many uh, uh, NFL, National Football League football players have kneeled during the, uh, the playing of the national anthem or the flag salute. And the first time it happened with just him involved, I really liked the way the press sought him out and interviewed him, interviewed him. But starting a couple months after that, the press, in my estimation, stopped even reminding folks via TV why it was that the kneeling was taking place, that Kaepernick and uh, most of the other African-American football players saw this as a way that they could uh, use the positions of high esteem in athletics to force people to think about and do some of the kinds of things that you all are about to do around the tables. Uh, think about the impact of the relationship between African Americans, particularly African American males, and the police, and to talk about economic inequality uh, as it uh, exists in our society. Those were the two things he said. It wasn't meant to be a direct affront to the American flag. It was meant to be that our country has to do a better job of practicing what it is uh, that we preach. Martin Luther King Jr. was especially a good at calling upon the great documents and creeds that symbolized American democracy in terms of what we would like for it to be, and then using that to inspire and motivate people of all races to come together and try to uh, get us closer to uh, the promised land uh, that he uh, uh, spoke of. Even his great speech in uh, I Have a Dream in 1963, he said uh, that we've come to this great city uh, to collect a debt long overdue. And uh, every time we had taken this check, this demand for freedom for black people uh, to the seats of power in our country, we always got the check marked insufficient funds. And it was his hope that with the great uh, gathering of two, more than 250,000 demonstrators that finally America will uh, cash the check that would get uh, black people and other disadvantaged folks in our society on the road to equal uh, treatment. I think that that uh, is some good food for thought as you embark upon the discussions uh, that we're going to 
uh, have at, at, at this juncture. I want to end by saying it is in the only geographic jurisdiction in the world community, we used to say this, the, the country, but our researchers have shown that there is no township, there is no city, there is no county, there is no province anywhere in the world who has given itself the honor of having its, its namesake, uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And because of that, we should be extremely proud of that fact. So with the challenge I've laid out to you, I want to take a moment now uh, to bring up our esteemed and honorable King County Executive, Dow Constantine. Uh, we started this effort to rename this county in 1999. Uh, I think that was a couple years before uh, Dow, he can correct us, uh, joined the county council. But he was definitely there in 2005 uh, when we finally were, uh, were able to have um, support uh, for the uh, renaming of our county in an official manner by having the state legislator, all 47 senators, and two-thirds of the representatives uh, vote to formally rename this county after Dr. King. And that laid the foundation for us in 2007, exactly 10 years ago. So this is not only a 50-year anniversary of Dr. King's death, it's the 10th anniversary of this beautiful county renaming itself after uh, Dr. I mean, King and adopting the, the logo uh, that reflects Dr. King as the image of democracy rather than an imperial crown. From the get, Dow supported that effort that uh, we and thousands and thousands of people throughout our county through signing up petitions and calling and sending up hundreds of letters, uh, Dow came forth immediately at the beginning of the struggle and said that he would uh, support it as well as many other um, council members and elected officials through it and reverence throughout our county. So I really appreciate that uh, about them. He's also uh, one of the architects of our equity and social justice commitment that was adopted by the county council and proposed to us by the county executive several years ago that forces us in the adoption of every piece of uh, important social policy or new legislation, we consider the impact that passage of it or non-passage of it will have on poor and disadvantaged and people of color and other often forgotten sectors of our population. So without further ado, I present to all of you our King County Executive Dow Constantine. Thank you very much, Councilmember Gossett, and uh, welcome to all my fellow employees, officials, others. Uh, thank you for joining us today as we honor the life and the work and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, I have to pause and just look out at this beautiful crowd, this wonderful gathering of the people who are doing the real work of creating that justice in our community. And I um, have to say, <clears throat> on a personal note, I am so proud uh, that along with a few of you in this room, we also helped save this building that just a few years ago was facing the wrecking ball. This old First United Methodist Church built in 1910 was uh, all but doomed. And through the work of uh, some in this room, our work with the city of Seattle, with private developers, we're able to save and restore and reuse this and we'll be here for another century for this community. And conveniently, it's very close to where many of us work. So thank you for joining us.
You know, we all wonder, uh, I think, at key points in our national discourse as we hear what's going on, what would Dr. King think of the times in which we live? What would he think of those who say they want to make America great again? Especially given that the most common response when he asked when exactly is it that uh, America was great is the 1950s. The 1950s, a, a time of plentiful industrial jobs and also segregated schools and also segregated public accommodations and also a theoretical right to vote that in practice was denied to millions. Today, more than ever, we as Americans need to prioritize equity and racial justice and civil rights. And we know the facts. Both locally and nationally, many communities of color are continuing to fall behind. Even as public high school graduation rates for all students are on the rise for all groups, the graduation rate for African American students remains below 70% in 12 US states. And for Latino students, in 10 states. And prosperous, progressive Washington state is on both of those lists. Washington is also one of the 11 states in the US with public high school graduation rates for low-income students below 70%. And in 2016, the median household income for white Americans was just over $65,000 a year. For Latino families, 48,000. For African American families, less than $40,000. We also need to look at race and its many intersections especially in a week in which women in the entertainment industry and elsewhere have announced times up on tolerating discrimination and harassment in the workplace. King County has been shown to have one of our country's greatest gender, gender wage gaps. More wage gap talking points, or most wage gap talking points state that women make 78 cents for every dollar earned by an equivalent male employee. But in fact, race compounds the inequity. Women of color are paid dramatically less, 56 cents on the dollar for African American women, 40 cents, 47 cents for Latinas. These are injustices we must address as we continue our work to break down barriers, to tighten systemic gaps for our employees and for all people who call this place home. These inequities are entrenched. They're entrenched in our community, and these inequities make it harder for people to get an education, to get a job, even to find a decent place to live. Now, as a county that proudly claims Dr. King as our namesake, as Councilmember Gossett alluded, we have a particular responsibility, a special responsibility, to advance racial justice in both our organization and our community. Two years ago, we created our first ever equity and social justice strategic plan. And that plan has received national recognition and praise. And we had a lot of help putting it together. Almost 700 of you, King County employees, participated in plan workshops. More than 100 community groups joined together to make their voices heard. The six-year strategic plan represents a critical opportunity for King County to do groundbreaking work. We've started to implement this plan. We are making changes that address the root causes of inequities. We are investing upstream where the needs are the greatest. And we will encourage innovation across King County government to help us be dynamic and culturally responsive. Our intent, our focus on racial justice must be absolutely clear and unwavering to achieve our goals. One major example of our new focus on addressing problems upstream is best starts for kids. 
The very first BSK program was an initiative launched a year ago with uh, families uh, who are teetering on the brink of homelessness to keep a roof over their heads. Well, this won't surprise anyone to learn that young people and families of color have been disproportionately impacted by our homelessness crisis. After a year, we found that 96% of the more than 1,000 participating families have a safe, secure place to live. That's some 3,000 people who are housed today across King County who otherwise might not have been. The majority of people who have been served by this program are people of color, and about half are African American. That's one reason why researchers at both MIT and Notre Dame are studying this initiative as an effective way to prevent homelessness. And I'm proud of how we have an explicit racial equity lens on this work. So other Best Art programs, very quickly, uh, expanded already effective home visiting programs like the Parent Children Home Program, opened new school-based health centers where students can get uh, a medical or dental or mental health treatment providers at no cost, provided leadership opportunities and mentoring programs that help young people reach adulthood connected and motivated and empowered. Through my executive order, King County is adopting a public health approach to detention in our effort to limit the traumatization of youth in detention and ensure families have greater access to the supports and services they need in the community. And we're using a racial equity approach to effectively lift youth of color given the disproportionality that exists in the justice system. We need to be explicit in our focus on black and brown youth. A multi-departmental team under the oversight of public health, Seattle and King County, is working to draft for us a proposal reorganizing juvenile detention services. And Deputy Executive Rhonda Berry is leading our zero youth detention work, using an interagency and community coordination strategy to further reduce the number of youth in detention. We are prioritizing racial diversity in our county workforce as well through our hiring and recruitment and retention processes, especially at the manager and supervisor positions where people of color are underrepresented. And we're tracking and being accountable for our goals, demanding change and improvements from all of our departments. Our goal is a King County government that at all levels more closely mirrors the people we serve and the creation of good job opportunities for all county residents. And in all of this, we rely on you, our employees, the best innovators and the champions for equity. Last year, we launched our ESJ Opportunity Fund created to provide King County employees with necessary financing to develop and implement projects that advance equity and social justice. And did you respond? Yes, you did. There has been great interest in this program, which demonstrates a tremendous level of commitment from our employees as individuals. And through a competitive process run by the Office of Equity and Social Justice, 17 of your proposals uh, were selected for funding from a field of nearly 40. And although it hasn't been formally launched, this is news alert for today, Council Member Gossett alluded to this, later in the program, we are all going to have an opportunity to participate in uh, a preview of a program the King County ESJ team has called Conversation Cafes on Race. I'm excited about this because as we celebrate Dr. King's legacy, as we celebrate our commitment to equity and social justice, this is going to give us an opportunity to really begin to bring our ideas and creativity and vulnerability to the table to move our agenda forward and not simply to discuss what we believe in in the abstract. 
Our goal is to normalize conversations about race and racial justice, not just as part of MLK Day, but part of the fabric uh, of who we are and how we want to work and relate to each other. The conversation cafes on race will encourage and promote real and meaningful conversations and interactions in the workplace and among colleagues, build a sense of belonging and community within departments and agencies across King County and create a space where employees can change or engage in these conversations in the workplace without fear of retaliation or ridicule or isolation. As an employee of Martin Luther King County, no matter what it says in your job description, we want you to have the tools to participate fully in this collective effort to create the long-term systemic changes this nation needs to be truly what it can. I believe we have the will and we have the means in this region, in this county, to create different outcomes than what we see in the national arena. We can create a King County where all people, where every child growing up here has the opportunity to fulfill their potential, where the human spirit can genuinely flourish, and where the promise of a truly great America can be made real for all. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to invite back someone with whom I work every day. As you know, the office, or you may know, the Office of Equity and Social Justice is uh, on my floor next to my office, so we are on, in touch continually. The director of King County's Office of Equity and Social Justice, Matias Valenzuela. So, Executive, so appreciate your leadership around uh, this work. Also, one more um, elected official, council member, Joe McDermott. Um, quick recognition of him. Thank you for coming. So we, um, as part of this work, I mean, it's, it's really, we tend to go always to the head, but it's also about the, the, the heart and actually the cultural component and the artistic component of this work is extremely important and so honored that we have some uh, musical performers for today. Uh, just gonna introduce them very quickly. Michael Hepburn, he's a keyboard artist, and Jill Higgins Henricks, a uh, flutist. Our deputies, our own employees, uh, with the Martin Luther King County Office of the Prosecuting Attorney. They will perform a contemplative medley of We Shall Overcome and lift every voice and sing, so thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just as a way to uh, usher in uh, the creativity and vulnerability spirit that uh, our wonderful county executive just spoke of, uh, if you're so inclined, you can close your eyes and visualize what I'm about to offer you. And if not, you can just focus on this idea, but consider a lighthouse offshore. Instead of a light, it dispenses justice. The seas, the seas are stormy, the weather is rough. Each and every one of you is a lighthouse whether you are a dignitary here or a staff person, you dispense justice to your coworkers, to the people of the community, to your constituents. You help guide them to outcomes that are just.